All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, as people are starting to get their seats, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll get started. We'll begin with uh, a prayer and I want to read Psalm 136 for that prayer. So we'll just put ourselves in a place and disposition of prayerfulness in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his mercy endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who spread out the earth upon the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made the great lights, his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule the night, his mercy endures forever. To him who struck the firstborn of Egypt, his mercy endures forever, and brought Israel out from among them, his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, his mercy endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his mercy endures forever, and made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, his mercy endures forever. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I bet you can tell why I picked that psalm, because it's a theological reflection on the topics we've covered all the way up until today. It continues on farther, but we haven't got there yet, so I stopped. Okay. But the psalms are beautiful. I hope that you're reading the psalms every day, because you're going to find that it repeats the themes and goes deeper into the spiritual meaning. The psalms are great prayer. Uh, por los que uh, la tecnología no está funcionando, levante la mano si necesita la tecnología. Ok, está funcionando. Si está funcionando, no está funcionando. Ok, so uh, in the backstage over there, Maria, it's not working right now. Ok, very good. You got it? Oh, now it's working. Ok, excellent. Good. Excellent. Good. All right, if you have problems, uh, pray. Just kidding. Ok. Ok, okay. no, si, si tiene problemas con la tecnología, uh, habla con uh, William. Ok, good. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll begin. Uh, tonight we're going through Exodus 1 through 19. Hopefully we'll get up to that point. Really the theme of tonight could be called Freedom Through Right Worship. So up until the, now, the book of Genesis has been really about that nuptial orientation of creation we've been talking about, that all of creation's ordered toward marriage, right? Now this, it switches a little bit where we get to the book of Exodus really looking at the purpose of Israel being to worship God. So the liturgical orientation is going to feature really large in the book of Exodus, okay? So this can be uh, summed up by the command of God that he says to the Pharaoh, let my firstborn son Israel go so he might worship me in the desert, okay? So that's, that's the plan. So as we start with Exodus 1 and 2, we can go ahead and open your Bibles and you can go with us uh, to, to read along as we're going. As we saw at the end of Genesis, Jacob and his 12 sons arrived in Egypt with their families, so 70 people in all, and after 400 years, they've multiplied exceedingly, and now they're a great nation. Okay, so the promise made to Abraham is provisionally fulfilled, where they've now become a great nation, but there's a problem. They're in slavery. Pharaoh becomes very afraid of them becoming so large, and so he tries to oppress them with hard labor, but it doesn't work. They keep multiplying, so now we have to implement population control. So he's going to ask the midwives to kill any of the male children that are born to keep the population down because then the wives, they have to marry Egyptian men and so then they won't be uh, so numerous. That doesn't work because the midwives don't cooperate. So then he commands his people, you just go to the houses and any male children you just take and throw them into the Nile River. So what abortion and infanticide lead to the condemnation of Egypt later. We have to see this in the context because sometimes we look and see, well, it's, it's not really fair. The whole nation of Egypt is punished with all these plagues. The fact is it was a culture of death and God's judgment was delayed for a time, but it always comes. God is perfectly merciful, but he's also just and every sin has consequences. You think that might have applications for us today? Absolutely, we need to repent because we are way worse than the Egyptians in that we are a culture of death. And we need to repent because the judgment of God is in fact coming for us if we don't turn our lives around, okay? So that's the context. So then we see Moses, who is one of these boys, who is hidden in a basket and put in the river. He is not the first child to have been put in a river, in a basket. This is kind of the equivalent of leaving your child on the doorstep, 
Okay? So this is the ancient version of that. Why? Because the Egyptians worshipped the Nile. The Nile was a god. And so the idea was if you put your child in the Nile, if a baby comes out of the Nile, it's like a gift from the Nile god, and hopefully somebody will take care of your kid. Now Moses wins the jackpot because who picks him up? The princess. <laughs> so the Pharaoh's daughter picks him up. That You just won the lottery. And so she um, says, okay, I'm going to adopt Moses. And in fact, I'm going to have, hire somebody to be a wet nurse for the child because I'm not with child right now. And so she actually hires his own mother to take care of him until he is of age that he's weaned to be handed over. And he becomes the prince of Egypt. Great. Awesome. But there's a problem. Moses, he uh, is impetuous. And he notices one day the Egyptians are not treating the Israelites well, and so he murders the foreman and then tries to hide his body in the sand, which of course, how well does that work? Sand doesn't stay where it is, does it? Kind of dumb. If you're going to bury a body, you better find a swamp. Okay? No, just kidding. Okay. Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> I've watched enough murder mysteries. I know how this works. Okay? All right. <laughs> Don't bury the body in sand. Not a good idea. So anyway, Moses is discovered, and so he has to flee. He has to beat out of town, and he goes into the desert, and he goes to the land of Midian where he meets his wife by a well. Surprised? No, because what is the pattern we've seen? Men meet their wives by wells. He then has to live for 40 years as a shepherd. So that's kind of penance, if you will. He has to grow up a little bit. Now, an interesting thought experiment. What would have happened had Moses not killed the Egyptian? It might have been a lot easier for him to help the Israelites. It's possible he could have been the prince of Egypt and influenced policy from inside. But because of his impetuousness, and his anger, he makes life a lot more difficult. Interesting thought experiment, maybe an interesting reflection for our lives, how we can sort of upset God's plan, if you will, and make it a little harder, but God can bring good out of evil. And in fact, that's what he's going to show, is that even though Moses has a lot of flaws, and he's really not the guy you should pick to be the leader, God still makes him the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. So that gives us a lot of hope. If you're a ding-dong, you can grow up to be somebody, okay? All right. So anyway, so Moses, he may now come to chapter 3 and 4, where uh, Moses, he's, he's shepherding the, the sheep, and he comes to Mount Horeb, and a, he sees a bush that's on fire, but it's not being destroyed. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. So he goes over, this is a revelation of God, where he's an all-consuming fire, but he doesn't destroy. Isn't that interesting? It's the idea of the Blessed Mother being an image of the burning bush, right? She is filled with divine fire, but not destroyed, right? So we see, again, typology in the Old Testament. The burning bush is an image of Our Lady who is set ablaze completely with the Holy Spirit, but not destroyed. And in fact, every Christian who's set on fire with the Holy Spirit, and they're not actually destroyed. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, continuing, God then tells Moses his name. He first says, I will send you to Pharaoh that you will bring forth my people. This is in Exodus uh, 3. 10, all right? Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? God says, I will be with you, and this will be a sign that I've sent you. When you've brought forth the people of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. So they're going to come back there, and we'll see that next time that we meet, okay? Now, Moses, uh, this is really remarkable. If God is talking to you, um, I think he should be a little more cooperative. Moses objects five times, and eventually tells God no. I know, like, I've just got to be thinking, okay, first of all, God says, hey, Moses, go over here. He's like, well, who am I to go? He's like, I'll be with you. He said, well, what am I going to tell them if I go? My, I will tell them my name. My name is I am. Well, what if they don't believe me? Here's some miracles. You can take a rod and throw it on the ground and become a serpent. You pick it up, it goes back to a stick. You can put your hand in your cloak, pull it out, it's leprous. Put it back in, it's healed. Pretty cool. They hate leprosy, right? Just like today, right? Uh, and then if they don't believe that, you can take some uh, thing, throw it down, and the water becomes blood. He's like, but, but I don't know what to say. It's like, did not God make the mouth? I can give you words. It's like, but, 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 send somebody else. He's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so then he picks Aaron, Moses' brother, to be his prophet to speak. Moses will be sort of like God, if you will, and Aaron will be the prophet speaking on Moses' behalf. Okay? So even though, like, that's pretty amazing. Like, I think if I were God, it'd be like lightning bolt. <laughs> I'm going to pick somebody else, man. You're terrible. All right? Um, but, but showing that even God can work with our weakness. And he condescends to Moses' weakness. Isn't that amazing? Bless you. Right? So, uh, but first of all, let's look at God's name here. This is really important because there's a little bit of controversy about this. There are four letters, if you will, uh, in Hebrew, kind of Y-H-W-H, because there's no vowels in Hebrew. It's not known how to pronounce it. Okay? There are different ideas about it, and in fact, Jehovah's Witnesses and others think it's pronounced Jehovah, but that's a corruption through the German. It's an interesting linguistic argument, but it's actually not the name of God. It's basically combining these letters with the vowels for Adonai, which is Hebrew for Lord, but that's, that's a little bit uh, too complicated. Basically, what we, what we do in Christian 
times we don't use the divine name out of respect for the Jews. We don't try and pronounce it. Because the Jews, what they did, whenever you see this, which is probably Yahweh, but we don't know for sure, the fact is it's always put in all caps in your Bible as Lord. So whenever they're trying to put these four letters together, the divine name in your Bible, it'll probably be bold, capitalized, Lord. Okay? And when they say Adonai, it's like Lord with a capital L, but the rest of the letters are lowercase. So when you see that, know that's what they're doing out of respect, because they don't want to say the divine name, because that's breaking the commandment to use God's name in vain. They were so afraid of doing that, they didn't want to say it. Okay? So it's very holy, but basically what it means is I am who I am. God's name is his essence. He is exact being. Some people say, who made God? Nobody, because he's being itself. He is the one who creates everything. He is the uncreated creator, the very philosophical idea. So God is the first principle of all creation. So his name reveals who he is. We've seen that throughout the Bible, haven't we? The name reveals who you are. And so God is revealing his name. He is existence itself, pure existence, okay? Um, and then he sends uh, Moses, he says, I'm also the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, right? That's my name forever, he says, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go forward to the Gospels, right? right? And, the, and he says, Jesus uses this verse to prove the resurrection. He says, this is my name forever. If his name forever is I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, it means they are alive. They're not dead. Yee! So Jesus is using the Old Testament to prove the resurrection. Okay, fun. Moving on. So now they're coming to Egypt, and uh, Moses is now trying to talk to Pharaoh to say, hey, let Israel go so they can go into the desert to worship God. And Pharaoh says, no way, Jose, um, that's not going to happen. And so he says, I'm going to make them work harder. If they think they're going to leave, no, we're going to get that stupid God idea out of their brains by making them work harder, right? Because maybe if they work harder, they'll forget about God. Does that sound familiar? People working really hard, consumed by work and not thinking about God, it's the same old trick. If you can just work hard, maybe you'll forget that you have a bigger purpose, okay? Now, what, what I didn't write down here is um, there's a Hebrew word that you've seen before, avad. Remember avad and shamar? Where did we see those words? The two words that described Adam's role, right? What does avad mean? To work, right? And so the idea is that God is saying it also means worship. So, so it's like it's a divine service piece. It's, it's, it has a double meaning. It's what the priests do in the tabernacle, but it's also what they're doing in Egypt. So there's this dichotomy that's happening. Who will you work for? Will you work for Pharaoh? Or will you work for God? And that's the tension of the whole book. Make sense? So God is saying, let my son Israel go out to worship me in the desert, to, to avad for me, to do divine work for me in the desert. And Pharaoh's like, no, they're going to work for me. Okay? And we're going to see who's going to win. Okay? So now what we have is we have the plagues, the ten plagues of Egypt. And the ten plagues of Egypt are a battle of the gods to show who is the Lord. And this is what's really cool. When I heard this, this was like a revolution for me. Basically, it's going to show that when you're in a pagan culture and everybody's worshiping all these idols, what's the only way you can break that idolatry? You have to show them to be absolutely worthless gods and God to be the most powerful God. And so what he does is the first thing he does, he turns the Nile into blood. Remember the Nile's a God? So it's basically what have you done? You've killed the Nile God. <laughs> now he's bleeding all over the nation, right? So he's saying, do you think the Nile's a God? Nope, I'm God. All right, next thing he does, but, but, but then the magicians in Egypt, they do the same trick. So like, oh, it's just a trick, right? We can turn water into blood too. But notice they can't change it. They can't turn it back. So they just make it worse, more blood, right? So Moses is the only one who can heal that situation. So he heals the situation. But then Pharaoh reneges on his promise to let them go. And so then he promises there's going to be frogs that go everywhere. And the frogs are symbolized by Hecate, who is the frog goddess of fertility. And so this is a mockery of her. You, you want to be fertile? I'll make it so fertile you can't get rid of these darn frogs, right? And the Egyptian magicians, the magicians, they can do the same thing. But guess what? More frogs <laughs> doesn't solve the problem. And so Moses, he promises, I'll get rid of them if you let us go. And Pharaoh's like, sure, I'll let you go. And of course he doesn't. Now, notice these first two plagues affect everybody. But from this point onward, God's going to make a distinction in the plagues. He's only going to have it affect the Egyptians and not the Hebrews. Remember where the Hebrews are living? They're living in the town of Goshen, right? It's a little suburb of Egypt. That's where they have all the, the flocks, where they're, they're shepherding the flocks because the Egyptians don't want shepherds around. But so this, now the rest of these plagues, they're going to be in all the rest of Egypt, but in Goshen, they're not. So it's showing this really clear distinction. Guess what, guys? If you're a part of this, you're going to get in trouble. But if you align yourself with Israel, you're going to be safe, right? 
So the gnats and the flies are two other gods, a beetle god, Kefir and Uachit, which is a fly god. And at this point, the magicians can't do it anymore. So then they say, this is the finger of God. So notice they, their sorcery could do a little bit, but there comes a point where the power of God is way, way different. And so maybe the first two plagues, but all the rest of the eight, they can't imitate. So it shows the limitation of the gods and the elemental spirits of this age. So if anybody's been involved in paganism or the new age, there are real miracles they can do. There are real things that look really impressive. But at some point, there is a very big difference between the power of God and the power of elemental spirits. Something to keep in mind. So uh, again, Pharaoh says he's going to let him go, but doesn't. Then we get to the death of the livestock. And Apis is a bull god, a god of fertility, which the Israelites are going to worship later with the golden calf, right? So again, they can't get rid of this god. He's really, he's really powerful. And then Hathor, a cow goddess. And there's other gods that are represented by livestock, and they all die if they don't go inside. Then boils, which now make the priests of Egypt literally unclean. They can't serve any longer. So it's basically now it's dismantling Egyptian religion. So now no longer the Egyptians can offer worship and sacrifice to their pagan gods. So now you see, with each act of disobedience by Pharaoh, things get worse and worse and worse for his people. See the consequences of bad leadership. It doesn't just affect you, it affects the whole nation. That's why it's really important we have good leadership, right? Because the sins of the leaders very much impact the, the people, right? So then we get to Sekhmet, who is the goddess of healing, shows her to be in, incompetent because she can't heal them of their boils and their illnesses. Then hail and fire destroy the, summer, the, the barley crops. So those are the sky gods, Nut, Shu, and Tefnut. And then locusts eat everything that's left. Senhem's the god of agriculture. So like literally, he's just dismantling everything. And then we get to the three days of darkness, and this one's amazing. Because imagine this, it says it's so dark. Let's, let's read this description of the three days of darkness. It's just so good. It says, this is in uh, chapter 10, verse uh, 23. Or 22. Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did they rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light where they dwelt. So in Egypt, there's thick darkness. They can't even see in front of their faces, but in Goshen, it's like, oh, shaft of light right over Goshen, but everything else is in darkness. You think that would have been a pretty impressive sign? By this point, the Egyptians are getting it. They're like, Pharaoh, like, don't you see what's happening? This is crazy. So the, the Egyptians are starting to give jewels and, and other possessions to the Israelites to try and get favor from them, right? And, and, but, but Pharaoh still has hardened his heart. Now, Ra is the most powerful god. Amon Ra is the sun god. And so three days of darkness shows, hey, we killed the sun god. He's not a god either. And then finally there comes the last straw, which is the death of the firstborn. And Pharaoh himself is considered a god. So if Pharaoh can't keep his son alive, then obviously he's not a god either. So it's, now we've dismantled the gods from the top to the bottom. Every single god in Egypt has been humiliated and shown to be no god whatsoever. Pretty cool, huh? Right? So there's a question, right? You can only serve two masters, right? So who are you going to serve? The first commandment is you shall love the Lord your God. with your, I am the Lord your God. You will love me with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? You'll have no other gods before me. Because all the gods of the nations are idols. They're worthless, right? Now, uh, this, this last one, before we, we see the death of the firstborn, we have a little bit of a break for chapter 12, where we see the institution of the Passover. Okay, and this is super important. This is uh, so important. I made another slide. Okay. This is in chapter 12 of Exodus, and we can really zoom in a little bit here for the Passover. Okay. There are certain rules for the Passover. This is the meal that is going to set them free from the angel of death. He says, I'm going to make an angel of death Passover. Let's hear what she say here. Okay. This is in, in chapter 11. Verse 4, Moses says, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go forth in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt will die, the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the maidservant, who is behind the mill, and the firstborn of all the cattle. There will be a great cry throughout Egypt, such as there has never been, nor will ever be again. But against any of the sons of Israel, either man or beast, not a dog will growl. Again, that distinction between Egypt and the Israelites. Okay? For those who love God, who obey him, they will be saved from the angel of death. Okay? So the Lord, this is in, in chapter 12, tell all the congregation of Israel on the 10th day of the month, they will take every man a lamb according to their father's house, be a male lamb without blemish, ha can't have any broken bones, got to be a perfect spotless lamb. And then after you kill it, 
you take the blood and you sprinkle the blood on the doorposts and the lintel with a branch of hyssop. Okay, does that sound familiar? Okay, we'll get back to that. And then the lamb needs to be roasted, not boiled or fried or anything like that, and then eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, and you have to eat the whole thing. So if you have a small family, you have to get together with another family so that you don't waste any of it. And you have to eat it all before the next morning. You can't leave any leftovers, okay? Whew, <laughs> pace yourselves, all right? <laughs> it was really important, okay? That was, that was God's command. He said, and, and the fact is that it's both a sacrifice and a meal. You can't just sacrifice the lamb. You have to sacrifice it and eat it. You must eat the lamb, because if you don't, then you're not gonna receive the benefit of the sacrifice. Really important. Then God commands, you will not just do this one time. You're going to celebrate this every year as a memorial so that the event of the Passover will be brought into the present. How many of you have ever been to a Seder Passover meal? Okay. They speak in the present tense, right? My, you know, our father, you know, it's like I was in exile in Egypt, right? You know, or I, you know, saying this, tonight is the night of the Passover, right? They don't speak of it as a past event. They're speaking about it right now. So their, their memory is bringing it present into the future. The saving event of the Passover is being brought here right now. When we have the new and everlasting Passover, right? It's the same idea at play that although the once for all sacrifice of Christ happened once on the cross, we make it present at the mass. The saving action of Christ is brought here, right? Do this in memory of me. It's not just remember it. It's saying, do this as a memorial offering, just as they did the Passover, where they made it present. In fact, Jesus is celebrating a Passover with his disciples, isn't he? But isn't there an interesting detail? Is there any lamb mentioned at the Passover in Luke's gospel? No. They just mentioned unleavened bread. What's the lamb then? Moving on. Okay. I'm going to leave that hanging. Okay. Yeah. But remember, if the Mass is the new and everlasting Passover, you have to eat it. What, is, what, is, what does he say in John chapter 6, right? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. Because the angel of death, if you didn't eat the lamb, you would die, even if you did everything else. So it's a whole package. You have to do the whole thing, right? So that's the Passover meal, okay? And the Passover sacrifice. Okay. So, sure enough, in chapter 12, verse 29, at midnight, the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, and there was a great cry in Egypt. It was not a house where one was not dead. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, go forth from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel. Go serve the Lord, if you have said. Take your flocks and herds and get out of here. Right? So so finally, he lets them go, and uh, they leave. But then, uh, not too far afterwards... um, uh, the Egyptians realized, well, wait a second, we lost all our labor force. We better go get them. <laughs> Pharaoh's heart is so hardened. And that's actually a theme here. We see two things that maybe read this a little bit. It said, Pharaoh hardened his heart and God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Those two things are said several times alternatingly. And you're like, well, which is it? It's both. And this is a, a mystery of our free will. God never condemns anybody. We condemn ourselves. But God will give us what we want. So the fact is, Pharaoh begins by disobeying God and keeps persisting in it until a certain point when his heart becomes hardened and then God finishes it because he gives Pharaoh what he wants, right? And he becomes so blind in his hardness of heart that he even pursues Israel uh, after all the ten plagues have happened. You go, how is that possible? Well, people who are blind do all kinds of crazy things when they're blind spiritually, right? So they come to the, the Red Sea, if you will, and there's a little controversy about this uh, in chapter 14 about if the Red Sea is actually the Red Sea or it's the Sea of Reeds. It doesn't really matter um, because the reason why people are trying to say it's not the Red Sea but the Sea of Reeds, they're trying to say, well, what really happened was it was a shallow body of water, you see. And so the Israelites, they kind of went across it, right? Because miracles don't happen, right? So there obviously wasn't like a wall of water to their right, to their left. They just kind of went through the river like that. There's actually a joke about this. There was uh, some people that were doing a Bible study, and uh, it was a modern Bible study, not like here, you know. And, uh, and this guy, he's really excited. He's like a new Christian. He's like, oh, it's so exciting. I can't believe it. I can't wait to read the scriptures and learn the word of God. And the professor's like, just calm down, buddy. It's just a book. And he's like, no, no, it's amazing. So he's reading. He goes, hallelujah, praise the Lord. The Egyptian, the, the, the Israelites went through the Red Sea with a wall of water to their right and to their left. And he, the professor says, oh, no, no, son, you see, it's not the Red Sea. Sea of Reeds. And it was probably just like a few inches. And so they kind of walked through on low tide. And he goes, oh. Keeps reading a little farther and he goes, Praise the Lord! The Lord drowned the whole Egyptian army in a few inches of water! (laughs) Right? That's the whole problem. 
this story of the crossing of the Red Sea is the single greatest event in Israel's memory. They didn't cook this up. They didn't cook this up because this whole story is what the nations are afraid of. They heard about the plagues in Egypt and what he did at the Red Sea. Even the other pagan nations knew the God of Israel was a pretty intense God who wiped out their enemies, right? So this story, if you go to Psalm 136, as we read, you see all of this reflection that's happening on this event that liberated them from slavery definitively. So we see in the Red Sea, there's a, there's a couple of things that are happening. One is that uh, it's a new creation story. Okay, so how, how is a new creation story? Well, Moses, we see this in chapter 14, verse 21, if you're following along. I'm just moving, I'm blitzing through, by the way. I apologize. We got a lot of thematic stuff to get through 19 chapters, but I think we're going to make it. Okay. So, chapter 14, verse 19. Okay. All right, so first, first I'll read the little back before, verse 12. Okay. So the the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, It's because there's no graves to die in Egypt. You've taken us away to die in the wilderness. What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Let us alone and serve the Egyptians, for it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Isn't that nuts? They've just had the ten plagues, and they're saying it would be better for us to die in Egypt than to die in the wilderness. To be a slave in Egypt than to die in the wilderness. Right? Crazy, right? But we're going to get back to that. Then Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, see the salvation of the Lord. He will work today. Right? The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be still. And then uh, Moses, uh, he stretched out his hand over the sea. Verse 21, The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. So again, there's, wa- there's breath over the water. There's the spirit hovering over the waters. And, the, and the, the, the water is separated, and there's dry land that appears. So it's like a new creation, right? The new earth, the waters are separated, divided, and they walk through it, okay? It says, the sons of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the host of Egyptians and discomfited the host of them, clogging their chariot wheels, so they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord says to Moses, stretch out your hands so the sea may flow back. It does, and they're completely destroyed. So we have an image of baptism where the waters cover over their enemies and destroy them. So Israel passes through the water from slavery to freedom. And the waters destroy all of their spiritual enemies, right? So it's an image of baptism. When you are baptized in water, you pass through death to life, and all sin is washed away, and all of your spiritual enemies are destroyed. Hallelujah. But here's the problem. They're saved from Egypt, but they're always free to go back. That's the same with baptism, too. Baptism does save you. Baptism does wash away sins, but each and every one of us has the choice to go back to slavery to commit sin again. That's why we need confession to go back to him, right? After baptism, if we fall. Make sense? Okay. So you see, I hope you can see in these first two books of the Bible, there's been a ton of reference to the sacraments. Like, and, and just all the groundwork of our faith is laid in these foundational books. That's why we're spending so much time on them, because a lot of our sacramental theology comes from these images and these stories. And if you don't get them, uh, you won't understand why we do what we do as Catholics. Okay. So they're set free, and they sing a song in chapter 15, which is great. Uh, The Lord, I will sing to the Lord. He's triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider, he's thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. It's my God, I'll praise him. My Father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name, right? And it goes on and describes poetically kind of what just happened, okay? All right, we come now to the end of when they get done singing, and now they come into the desert, and things aren't so great. So we come to the end of chapter 15, and we see them coming to a place of bitter water. They find some water, but it's bitter. It's called Mara. This is in, in verse 23. They kept, it was bitter, so they came to made it water, Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? He cried to the Lord. The Lord showed him a tree, a branch, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Now, this is just like a little, a little uh, interesting throwaway verse, right? But isn't that interesting? Water that is that is uh, unclean or bitter becomes sweet through wood, right? So the idea is like our bitterness becomes sweet through the wood of the cross, right? So again, typology over and over again. Every page, if you're looking for future fulfillment, there's spiritual truths that are being there that just are kind of almost throwaway lines, right? Right. 
So then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. So we have, there's bitter water, it's made sweet by a tree, and then they end up at an oasis, right? So isn't that beautiful also, that our bitterness, once it's been made, healed by the wood of the tree, we come to the oasis of heaven. Woo! <laughs> But now without suffering, we've got to pass through the desert. And so now they come to the desert. So now we're here in this third section, if you will, in chapter 16. They set off from Elam. That was a nice little respite. But now they're going to complain again because that's what they do. They whine all the time. Okay. All right. So they come out. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness and said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate bread to the full. You have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Why did we come out in the wilderness again? To worship God. Right? So, no, you didn't bring us out to worship God. You brought us out here to kill us. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The hardness of heart is not just in Pharaoh. It's in the Israelites. They've been in Egypt too long. Egypt has infected their way of thinking and their life. And while they have been removed physically from Egypt, their hearts are still there. And it's going to take 40 years in the desert to purify them of Egypt. And they're still going to want to go back. It's nuts. And you think, well, how is that possible? Well, that's our life, isn't it? Even though we know the right thing to do, if we've been living a life of sin, it is so hard to change our habits, isn't it? I mean, if, if you've been living a certain way for the majority of your life, and all of a sudden you're like, I want to follow the Lord... Expect a battle. It's not easy to change your life overnight. It takes time and penance and discipline to do that, and it's not fun. So they complain, and the Lord says to Moses, Behold, I'll rain bread from heaven for you. The people will go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether they'll walk in my law or not. So he'll give them daily bread from heaven. Isn't that interesting? We're just going to start to get some ideas. They seem cooking up a little thing here. Okay, so bread comes down from heaven. And everybody, whether they gather a little bit or a lot, have just enough. Okay? And he says, that's just a day's portion. You eat it that day, all of it. Don't leave any for the next day. It's an act of trust. Don't leave any for tomorrow. God will feed you again tomorrow. They don't trust him immediately, and the stuff they keep turns to worms. It's just like, okay, guys, I told you, like, obey the Lord. He's going to feed you. Like, he's going to have to trust them. Okay? So, so they, they, they do. Uh, and then he says, you can gather it on six days, but on the seventh day... Uh, don't gather any bread. I will not give you any bread on that day. I will give you, you'll gather a double portion on Saturday, and that's or Friday, and that's the one day that you can keep it overnight for the next day, and it won't rot. Okay? Now, of course, they don't listen to God either, and they go out on the Sabbath, and he's like, stop it! <laughs> I'm telling you, believe me. Now, there's a lot of people that try and figure out what was the manna. Now, I mean, I mean, I know, bread from heaven, right? But what was it really, right? Now, this is a problem, right? Because, um, uh, they, they think, well, maybe it was like a secretion from an ant, you know, and there's, and there's actually, if you go to the Middle East, they, they have a thing they call manna, which is kind of a secretion from a plant or whatever, and it's kind of sweet and honey and sticky. The problem is you can't get enough of that stuff to feed several hundred thousand people in the desert every day for 40 years. And by the way, if it's from an ant or a secretion from an ant, how does God get the ants to stop making it on the Sabbath day every week? for 40 years. <laughs> that actually is a greater miracle than just giving them bread from heaven. <laughs> okay? So the fact is, is that the church has always said this is a supernatural event. It is. It's, it's supernatural bread that came down from heaven. And this is, in fact, what we see uh, in John chapter 6. This is the great miracle of Moses. Again, like the, the, there are two great miracles that are remembered of Moses, other than the plagues. It's parting the Red Sea, and Moses brought us manna from heaven. We hear that in John chapter 6, right? He says, what sign can you do? Moses gave us bread from heaven. And Jesus says, no, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven. It was my Father who gives you bread from heaven. And I tell you, whoever eats the bread that I will give will never hunger again. Those who ate the bread in the desert, they died. But the one who eats the bread I will give will never die. And they said, give us this bread always. He says, I am the bread of life. The one who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. And they're like, whoa, they're horrified. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? He says, amen, amen, I say to you. I'm joking. No. <laughs> it is only a symbol. Amen. No, he doesn't say that. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. My flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. He says it multiple times in multiple increasingly graphic ways to say the miracle of the manna in the desert was a prefigurement of what I am doing right now because the manna that fed the Israelites for 40 years, 
they, they died and they perished. If you go to 1 Corinthians 10, this is, this is the one I love preaching on. I don't get a chance to do it very often, but boy, oh boy. You go to 1 Corinthians 10, and it talks about this event and why the Israelites are so dumb. Okay. Listen to this. This is, this is 1 Corinthians 10. I want you to know, brothers, our fathers were all under the clouds, the cloud of fire by day, pillar of fire by night. They all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, and all ate the same supernatural food, and all drank the same supernatural drink. So again, when they're thirsty, they say, oh, we're dying of thirst. He's like, okay, fine. And so God says, strike this rock, and water will come out of it. Have you ever seen water come out of a rock? All right? He says, water came out of the rock. And so here, here we come. It says, they all drank from the supernatural rock which followed them. So not only did the rock water, but they, it actually followed them around the desert. Now, if you have a rock that's pouring out water, falling around the desert, isn't that a pretty cool ongoing miracle? Right? He says this, and the rock was Christ. So he's saying that rock was, a, was in fact a manifestation of the Lord before he came in the flesh as Jesus, right? Nevertheless... With most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. He's saying they went through all these amazing miracles. They even had bread from heaven for 40 years. They had a rock that's full out water, and they follow, it followed them around, and they still died in the desert, apart from God. Most of them, because of their disobedience. Listen to this. Now, these things were warnings for us, not to desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to dance, which we're going to talk about next time, right? We must not indulge in immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put the Lord to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. We're going to see all that stuff next week. So the story of Israel in the desert, St. Paul is going to say very clearly, this is an image of the church. And Christians, if you think you can just be baptized and just receive Holy Communion and not change your life, you will die like them. That's what he's saying. The sacraments are not magic. They don't automatically just change your life and you don't have to do anything else. No, you must conform your life to the grace you receive. The Israelites had tremendous miracles done for them. Incredible things. But because their hearts were hard, it didn't do them any good. They ate the bread, but they died. They passed through the Red Sea, but they still were slaves because they weren't willing to put to death the old man. See how pertinent this is? How important this is for us today. Like, it's, just, it's so real and it's so true. We need this. Okay. I think we're close to the end here. Yes. So now we come uh, to the end of chapter uh, uh, 16. And then he basically says, we want to keep some of this manna. This is chapter 16, verse 32. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer, which is an amount, I guess this little jar, be kept throughout your generations that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness. So now there's going to be a little portion that they're going to keep, and later they're going to put it in the ark. So there's going to be some of the bread from heaven they're going to keep as a witness that they can see to be reminded of God's faithfulness. Sound interesting? Like, we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness, so we look at the bread from heaven and are reminded of God's faithfulness. Interesting, okay? And so then it says, the sons of Israel, so they took a jar, put manna in it, and placed it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. So Aaron placed it before the covenant to be kept, and the sons of Israel ate the manna 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of Cana. Okay. So the manna continued all throughout the time that they're in the desert up until they enter the promised land. All right. Then they have the water from the rock, etc. Okay. And then they have the story of the Amalekites. We had this story come up, I think, either at daily mass or the weekend mass. I can't remember. Was it a daily mass or a weekend mass? I can't remember. It was a, it was a couple weeks ago where we had it. So uh, the Amalekites, they're some of the inhabitants of Canaan, right? And they come and attack Israel from behind. So it's kind of a dirty move. We're going to see uh, in other books, they're going to describe how this battle happens here. It's just sort of a, a, abbreviated so we don't get exactly how bad it is. But the Amalekites attack them. And so Joshua, who is Moses' second in command, Joshua goes out to lead the Israelites in battle, and Moses goes up the mountain with Aaron, the high priest, and her, his assistant. And, and Moses lifts up his staff, and as long as he has his arms outstretched, Joshua is victorious in battle. But as soon as his arms get tired and he raises them down, blows them down, 
they start to lose. So Moses gets tired, of course, just has to hold them up for several hours. And I don't know if you've ever tried to do this for more than a few minutes. It's difficult, especially you're holding something, right? So, so Aaron and her, they stand on his sides and hold up his arms, and Joshua is victorious. Okay. And then there's a promise that God gives. In verse 14, the Lord said to Moses, write, this is a memorial in the book and recite it in the ears of Joshua. I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So that's, that's an important promise because it's going to be fulfilled later on. You're going to see it, uh, how it's fulfilled uh, later on. Okay. And at the end of chapter 18, we see Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. Um, he comes and uh, he sees how Moses is running things. He's like, dude, you're killing yourself. You're trying to run like a couple hundred thousand people and be the judge of everybody. That's nuts. You need to get some help, right? So he says, you need to hire some people. Basically, you need to find some good leaders who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate a bribe, place them over men, have rulers of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them judge the people. Every great matter they bring to you, but smaller matters they decide among themselves. So pretty, pretty sound advice. Moses takes it, thankfully, and, uh, and things tend to go better after that. Okay, we're at chapter 19, so we'll go ahead and stop. One word about that extending of hands over the battle do you notice any typology there as long as moses keeps his hands up joshua is victorious now joshua that name in hebrew is yeshua who else has that name jesus right so the, yeah oh that joshua right there he also has that name yes thank you josh Eckstein, thank you very good i knew somebody's listening okay all right so <coughs> So we have, of course, the extended hands of Moses, the mediator between God and man, who, while his hands are outstretched, the enemies of God are defeated. And Joshua, being the captain who leads them, and so both Moses and Joshua are combined in the person of Christ on the cross, his hands being held up by the nails, defeats all of the armies of the devil and Satan, being the new Moses and Joshua at the same time. The new and definitive Yeshua, who conquers not the Amalekites, but the devil himself and all the fallen angels. Good. We are right at time, so that's good. We're going to break up into our groups. I want to just give you um, a couple of questions. You have, if you brought your Bible Basics book, um, there are a few questions there for chapter four. You can use those if you like. I also promote, propose to you a couple of other questions that you might find interesting if you don't like those. One is this one. Some people think if I only saw a miracle, I would believe. Why do you think Israel kept wanting to go back to Egypt after everything they saw and experienced? Maybe it's a good question to talk about. Why do you think they kept wanting to go back even after seeing all the great stuff and experiencing all the great stuff they saw? And how does it connect with your own life experience? Right? So that might be a good question. And then what connections do you see between the Passover, the manna, and the mass? So feel free to talk about any of that stuff or any of the questions in your book. Go ahead and RCIA can go with Danielle to the parish hall. And those who are entering the communion with the church, they can go there. Um, all of the middle schoolers up here, high schoolers over here, adults, go ahead and try and find your group and uh, go. Also, question jar will be out in the lobby if you want to put any more questions in the jar anonymously. Thank you. All right, let's go, go on in. We'll, we'll gather them real close. So, so high school, all the way up here, just fill in. Middle school, all the way up here, we'll fill in. Anybody in the wing?
wings, we'll just come on over into this area. There's no need to be in the wings. Let's come over in here. Thanks. Come on over. Let's go. Come on, guys. Let's move. Thank you. Right. Well, good. well, good to see all of you guys again this, this week. How many of you were able to go to the healing night last week? Okay, what do you think? Any feedback? Pretty good? What's, what's, I just want to hear like a, a highlight or two if there was something that you experienced that was really neat. So anybody raise your hand if you want to share something. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you experienced? Sure. Yeah. Was it cool? Yes. Okay, very good. Did anybody, did anybody have an experience of something that happened to them that they wanted to share that was really neat from last week? Okay. All right. For those, for those who weren't there uh, this last week, uh, I encourage you to watch it. It was, it was really beautiful. We had a Eucharistic procession with the Blessed Sacrament all around the church, and uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of beautiful things that were happening. So I encourage you to come and do a holy hour. I encourage you to take time and pray with the Lord, because the same Jesus was here all the time. Tonight, what I want to do a little bit is, I, I think what the Lord wants us to do is he wants us to continue kind of this idea of, of going deeper into how to pray, right? And some things that can help us to pray. Last, last two weeks ago, we did the relics. You guys remember that when we did the relics? Was that cool? Yeah. There's some other things that can help us to pray. Um, there's two things I want to talk about tonight. Um, one is the St. Benedict Medal. How many of you know about the St. Benedict Medal? How many of you have one? Anybody? Okay. Who here has never heard of this thing before? Have you ever heard of one? Okay. No idea. Okay. So, who knows about St. Benedict, firstly? Okay. St. Benedict, yeah, a couple guys. What, what do you know about St. Benedict? I know he's a saint, and I'm pretty sure he was a priest. That's correct, yes. So, he's, he's a monk and a priest. He founded the Benedictines. How many of you have been to Mount Angel? Okay. There's a monastery up there of Benedictine monks. Okay, So if you ever want to see what the life of the Benedictines are like, it's really beautiful. right? So St. Benedict, um, this medal um, is a cross on it. I'm just going to draw this a little bit just so you can see it a little bit better. I'll draw it real big so you can see it round metal. On one side it's got a cross and it's got a few letters on it. So it's got cross or holy father Benedict. What I want, what I'm going to do actually is a lupe and a couple others. If you could help me to hand out these just for people who would like one. I'm going to share the story of these. These are blessed. The purpose of this medal it says the cross of our holy father Benedict. Okay, you just hand them out. If people would like one, you have them. These are a gift for you. They're holy, so they're blessed. And I'll explain what they're for in a minute. St. Benedict was a really holy man, and he, he was known for the power of his prayers. People would come to him, and they'd ask him to pray for them. He raised a couple people from the dead. Uh, he drove out demons. Uh, and there was a, a couple of important stories in his life. On the back of the medal, when you have it, you'll see a picture of St. Benedict and on either side of him, there, is, there are two pictures. One is of a bird, and then the other is of a broken cup. And these were two events in his life where he was saved from an assassination attempt by the power of the cross. So his brothers did not like him very much because he was very strict, and so they wanted to kill him. And so they poisoned his bread one day at dinner. And he made the sign of the cross, why you always bless your food before you eat it. Okay? He blessed his food, and a bird flew in the window, grabbed the loaf of bread, and flew out. So he was saved from that uh, poisoning attempt. And the second time, they poisoned his wine at the dinner table. He blessed the cup, and the cup broke. Okay? So uh, he's an exorcist. He's known for protection against poisoning and illnesses and all kinds of things. This metal um, is a sacramental. It's like holy water. Okay? So it's not magic, but it's blessed. And the idea behind it is it's used in exorcisms. Okay? And so the way it is typically used, I wear mine all the time. Um, for protection against the evil. Around the outside, there's a prayer of exorcism that says, get behind me, Satan. Do not tempt me with your vanities. The cup you offer is evil. Drink the poison yourself. So it's a powerful exorcism prayer. 
And then on the cross, it has uh, some letters that say, may the cross of Christ be my light and let the dragon not be my guide. So it's like it's a bold proclamation. I belong to Jesus. I don't belong to the devil. Okay. And then uh, on the other side, uh, it says, may his presence protect us now and at the hour of our death. So the way this metal works is that if you find yourself afflicted spiritually, you can take it and dip it in water and drink the water. And it's like a minor exorcism on yourself. If you feel tempted, depressed, really sick, um, you can use this for a medicinal cure as well. Um, I can share a couple stories, one of which was um, uh, one of our kids who was here um, a couple of years ago. He's now in college. His name's Jonah. How many of you know Jonah White? Anybody know him? Okay. All right. A couple people know him. Jonah, great kid. Um, we went to a youth conference, and at the youth conference, he got really ill. Like, as soon as the doors opened to the youth conference, he got a super pounding bad headache. And he was like, I've never had a headache this bad. We thought he needed to go to the hospital. So he could, he could barely breathe. He, he, was, he was like really bad. He all turned pale. But it was like right at the moment the conference started. So we're like, this is weird. Something's odd. So we started to pray. And he said, it just feels like pounding right here. So I laid a hand on his head. I laid a hand on his head. And he says, ah, whatever's in the front of my head went to the back of my head. I'm like, that's interesting. That's not a headache. So put a hand on the back of his head. And he said, ah, whatever was back there moved to the front of my head. I'm like, oh, okay, this is not a normal headache. There's something that happened here. So I said, what I want you to do is go to confession, but before you do that, I want you to take this Benedict medal, dip it in water, and had him drink. As soon as he drank it, completely the headache went away. 100% gone. So it was an exorcism. It was like a deliverance immediately, right? Uh, another instance that happened was actually to me. Um, I was sick for a couple of days, just congested and, and other things, and I was getting really bothered. I'm like... St. Benedict, please help me out here. And I just dipped the metal in water and drank it, and instantaneously it went. And I'm going, well, wait, I wasn't, I mean, uh, I didn't really expect, uh, thank you. Because <laughs> I, I'd seen it happen to other people, but I hadn't had it happen to me. And so um, it doesn't happen all the time. It's not magic. But the fact is, is that um, uh, St. Benedict is a very powerful intercessor. So I, I give that to you, um, that you can wear it. Because I know in the world that we live in, there's a lot of darkness, okay? So it's important that we're protected, and it's important that if you're oppressed, you call upon the name of the Lord. It's not magic, but it's saying if you, it is blessed by a grace of Jesus through the prayers of St. Benedict for you to help you in your struggles, okay? Sound good? Okay, so I give that to you. If we need more, I have a few more up here, um, and we have more in the confessional. So there's more in the confessional if you would like to grab some, okay? That's one thing. The other thing is the rosary. How many of you have a rosary? Who does not have a rosary? Okay, whoever does not have a rosary, we have free rosaries for you. And these are a gift that was brought back by a parishioner who went to the Holy Land. So these are special rosaries that are made of olive wood from the Holy Land. So if you don't have one, keep your hand up high. Lupe's got a gift for you, okay? Because tonight we're going to talk a little bit about how to pray the rosary better. Because I think a lot of you might pray the rosary, but you might be like, eh, I don't know if I like it very much. I'm going to teach you a way that's going to change your life. If you pray the rosary this way, you're going to find it to be really fruitful and beautiful. Okay? All right. So, who here has never prayed the rosary before in their life? Okay, a couple people. All right. So, the prayer of the rosary is very simple. We have pamphlets in the back, and so um, we can have a few of those out for those so you can take one home. Um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about it. Looks like this. You've all seen one before, right? Okay. The rosary is a prayer of meditation. What does that mean? It's a prayer of, of reflecting prayerfully on the mysteries of the life of Jesus. Okay? So it's like reading the Bible without a book. That's the idea. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a movie, but not. Okay? It's deeper. What you're doing is you're meditating on the mysteries of Jesus' life with Mary. Do you think Mary knew Jesus better than anybody else? Yes, she's his mother, she knows him better than anyone else, and she saw all of the events up close and personal. So if you want to know what happened in Jesus' life, you need to ask the Blessed Mother to show you, and she does. There are five sets of ten beads, and basically what you do is it's two parts. It's part vocal prayer and part mental prayer. Okay, the vocal prayer are the prayers of the Hail Mary and the Our Father and the Glory Be. Okay, those are the basic prayers. The mental prayer is playing the scene of the scripture in your mind as you are saying the vocal prayers. So it's not enough just to say the prayers. Hail Mary, Grace, the Lord, bless our God. That is a, it's not useless, but it's pretty close to useless, okay? Because if your heart is not engaged in it, you're not going to get much fruit out of it. 
You'll get something, but not very much, okay? So a lot of people know how to do the vocal prayer, but not a lot of people know how to do the mental prayer. So I'm going to teach you tonight how to do the mental prayer part, okay? Now, what I'm going to share with you tonight is just the first part. You're going to find as you pray the rosary more often, you're going to come up with your own reflections because the Blessed Mother is going to teach them to you. And that's going to be really cool when you start discovering that, okay? So everybody have one now? Everybody have a, not, anybody not have a rosary right now? Okay, all right. So here's what we'll do. Is we're just going to pray one decade of the rosary together to show you how this works, okay? And the, the mystery that we're going to do is we're going to do... Is our favorite mystery that anybody has that you'd like to pray? Yes, Lorenzo. I think the crowning, the crowning of thorns. Excellent. So there are, there are certain sets of mysteries. The first is the joyful mysteries, which talk about Jesus' infancy and early childhood. Then there are the luminous mysteries that talk about his public mis- ministry. There's the sorrowful mysteries that talk about his passion and the glorious mysteries that go the resurrection up through the glorification of Mary and the church in heaven, okay? So the crowning of thorns is the third sorrowful mystery, okay? Now, as we pray this mystery, what I want you to do is I want you just to eliminate distractions. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna have you just take the rosary beads in your hand, okay? So if you don't have it out, get it out right now, okay? And then I want you just to go to that third section. So skip one, two, you're on the third section right here, okay? And then you can just use one hand or two And as we're going through each Hail Mary, you slipped one bead through your fingers, just very gently. Okay, try not to move too much. Okay, just kind of hold your hands just kind of at your lap, just in a relaxed position. I want everybody to just kind of look forward. You don't have to look, you know, at me. I just just listen a little bit and just close your eyes, if you would, just eliminate distractions. And what we're going to do is we're going to just pray together. I'll pray the first part, and then you can respond to the second part. And we'll do it slowly. And as we're praying it, we're just going to reflect on the scripture that I talk about in the beginning. Okay, so let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The third sorrowful mystery, the crowning of thorns. After the soldiers had beaten him, they took thorns and made them into a crown and placed them on his head and beat it into place with rods. The thorns were so deep that they penetrated even the skull. Lord Jesus, as we meditate on the crown of thorns, we ask that you would heal all of us who suffer from anxiety or anguish or worries in our minds. Jesus, may your blood that came down from the, from the thorns heal the places of our mind that need healing. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, sinners now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. How was that? Wasn't that fun? See, it, how many of you feel more peaceful now? Did anybody receive something while we were praying? Were you able to see that image clearly in your mind? Yeah. Was it helpful? You see, when you pray the rosary, friends, it's, it's not just saying words. It's actually allowing the Lord to lead you to reflect on these things, right? Because as we reflect on the saving truths of the gospel, just as like when we read the scriptures, our minds are changed and our hearts are changed. If we reflect on these stories with Our Lady, then she's going to teach us really beautiful things. I've been praying the rosary every day um, for a long time now. But I started praying it when I was in high school. And it was the best decision I ever made. We started praying it, my brother and I, when we drive, drove to school. So if you have time in your car, it takes about 15 minutes. right? So you can do it while you're walking to school, when you're walking home. When you're driving, um, my brother and I did not get along at all. Some of you have difficulties with your siblings, right? I, I had a problem with my brother. We and I, did, he, we didn't like each other at all. And so we didn't want to talk to each other in the car, so we prayed the rosary. It was a better idea. <laughs> so we prayed the rosary together, and after two years of driving to school and praying the rosary together, we were friends. It was a miracle. Absolutely a miracle, I can tell you. He, he punched a hole in the wall one time to get at me, so um, we were not very... Um, friendly with each other, um, and I like to push his buttons, Our Lady changed us, and we're good friends now today. He comes down, at, he was the one who did the music for us at the, at the last healing night, so, so yeah, so our relationship has changed a lot, and Our Lady is very responsible for that. So if you have difficulties in your family, if you have difficulties in your life, Our Lady will help you, I guarantee it. So pray the rosary every day. It takes about 15 minutes, it's a beautiful prayer, and uh, it'll change your life, so good. Any questions about the rosary? Any other questions not about the rosary? <laughs> now, just so you know, there is another kind of rosary that I also recommend to you very much that I only discovered in the last couple of years. It's called the Seven Sorrows Rosary. How many of you heard this one? A few people. It looks a little different. This one's a like a dog tag kind of one, so it looks a little different, but, but it has seven sets of seven. It doesn't have five sets of ten. It has seven sets of seven, and they're different mysteries. And Our Lady makes particular promises on this rosary, and this one you might like. She promises that those who pray this rosary will be set free from obsessions and compulsions. So if you are, have OCD, or if you have really strong temptations or negative thoughts, or despair, or other things like that, she promises healing of our minds for those who pray this. So I really recommend it to you very much. And the reason why is because it's like focusing on the sorrowful mysteries, but they're different. They're focusing on the sorrows of Our Lady, particularly. I'll give you an example. So one of the mysteries of the Seven Sorrows Rosary, we'll pray together, is when Mary and Jesus meet on the road to Calvary. So picture this. So maybe just close your eyes and just picture this scene, and then we'll, we'll just pray the seven Hail Marys together. But this is the power of the seven sorrows rosary. When we meditate on this and we feel compassion for what Mary is feeling, it gives her permission to reach into the area where we're suffering. So it's kind of, it sounds interesting, but like if we become sad over what makes Mary sad, then she reaches into our hearts and heals the things that are making us sad. Kind of interesting, right? So I, just, I invite you into this meditation, and uh, you might have your own meditation on it, but, but I'm just going to lead you in this, and we'll pray it together and see what Our Lady does. Okay? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. The, third, the fourth sorrow of Our Lady, Mary meets Jesus on the road to Calvary. 
Blessed Mother, you saw your son beaten to a pulp, bleeding, carrying a heavy cross, unjustly tortured, and being whipped, even though he barely had the strength to move. He comes up to you, and you stand there helpless, looking at him, not knowing how to help, not being able to help. But yet your look tells him, I'm here with you, son. I'm here with you. I don't know how to help you, but I will be with you until the end. I will walk with you. Blessed Mother, we just ask that as you stay with your son, you would give us the grace to stay with you in the midst of our own suffering, in the places where we feel that we might not be able to do anything and we're just suffering. Please help us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, or without end. Amen. Most sorrowful mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you get it? How is that? Do you see the power that can have in your life? Because no matter what you're going through, our Lord understands it, and Our Lady does too. She's the refuge of the afflicted. So whatever, whatever you're going through, whatever dark times you go through, our lady's there to console us, right? It's beautiful. It's a great gift. So I offer that to you. Plus, it's just important that we're praying every day. And so the rosary, if you're not doing any prayer, begin with the rosary. It's a really easy way to get started to learn how to pray. She will teach you how to pray. And then you'll do other kinds of prayer that are a little more complicated. We'll get into some of that as we go on with this year. Okay? Sound good? I think it'd be good that we just learn how to pray better. Because if we pray, God's going to reveal this stuff to you. If you don't pray, it's kind of wasted. It'll come in one ear and then go out the other. Nobody wants that, right? Okay. Sound good? Any questions for me? You got me uh, as a captive right here. If you want to ask anything before the adults come back in the room. Anything? No? Yes, no? Maybe so? Got one back there? Yes? Can you tell us where the rosary came from? Oh, very good question. Where did the rosary come from? Um, so the rosary, in its current form, came from St. Dominic. So prayer beads have been around a long time. And so ancient monks, they would have uh, what they called the Jesus prayer, where they would say, Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And they'd have a bunch of beads, and they would just do that all day long. They'd breathe in, Jesus, Son of the living God, breathe out. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And that would be kind of a meditative prayer all day long. The prayer that we have, the rosary, came in the 13th century, or 12th century, with St. Dominic. So Our Lady appeared to St. Dominic and said, by the means of the rosary, by preaching the rosary, you will convert all the enemies of the church. Right? And so uh, it was given as a spiritual weapon um, to St. Dominic to uh, combat the errors of the day, which were many. 
in the church, a lot of corruption in the church and in the world. And so by preaching the mysteries that were contained in the rosary and then by praying them, it brought about conversion of many, many thousands of people throughout Europe. So that's where it came from, historically speaking. A little debate about that, but they're right. The Dominicans are right. They, they invented the rosary. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Question over here. Why specifically lambs and bread? Why lambs and bread for the Passover? Um, good question, because God's writing the story, and he knew how it would end, and so he's trying to tie together all the details. I don't know why. You should ask him. But it's saying, if, if God's writing the same story from beginning to end, it makes sense once Jesus comes, what it's all for, right? But in, the, in that time, it doesn't necessarily make sense why a lamb. I don't know. Could have been a sheep. It could have been a goat. Could have been. Some, I mean, and actually, you can choose either a lamb or a goat if you couldn't afford a sheep. So you could do that as well, right? But yeah, good question. Yeah, but one of Yeah. Uh, what is a demon? What is a demon? Good question. A demon is a fallen angel. So, you know how God He created all the angels, right? A third of them fell. A third of them rejected God's plan. And so those are what we call demons. They, they have chosen themselves instead of worshiping God, right? So um, they are the ones who serve Satan and themselves and their own interests. So, yes, uh, demons prowl about the world and they rule the underworld, right? So Because God in his, has created a place for them that's apart from him called hell because they don't like being around God. So as a mercy, he creates a place that is as far away from him as possible. But yes, they, they do, uh, they, they, the demons are, are operative in the world until the end, where they will be definitively put into hell away from the righteous. Yeah. Does that answer the question, or was there something more you want to know? Yeah. Yeah. They're pure spiritual beings, so they don't have bodies, right? But sometimes when people, they see spiritual, they see demons, they see other things, it's, it's demons taking on material reality and manipulating it, but demons don't have bodies. So they're, they're pure spirits, just like angels are pure spirits. Good question. Yeah, come on over here, Douglas. Oh. Yeah. So, my question is: ¿Cuántos misterios son los que tiene el rosario? Son cinco o son más de cinco o más de siete? Uh, bueno, entonces un rosario tradicionalmente es quince misterios, pero Juan Juan Pablo II apuntó cinco más, entonces hay veinte si 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 contan los los misterios luminosos. Pero usualmente cuando hablamos de un rosario hablamos de cinco misterios. Um, so, so the question was how many mysteries are there in the rosary and it's saying well when we say a rosary usually we're talking about five mysteries but um, the saints uh, uh, Saint Louis de Montfort would talk when he's talking about a whole rosary he's talking about 150 mysteries or he's talking about 150 Hail Marys so he's talking about uh, three sets he's talking about 15 mysteries because that was before the luminous mysteries were invented by John Paul II so yes good question buena pregunta yep. yes Douglas in the Bible a few times I've seen the word leviathan mentioned is that another way of saying demon or is it like a translation thing good question uh leviathan is complicated i uh, i'd have to i don't want to speak out of turn a uh, leviathan is kind of a symbol for um any of the 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 like the the worst possible sea beast there is so sometimes it's used for the devil other times it's used for just uh the, the great sea monsters that we don't know exactly what they are right so the, the the jews would talk about leviathan being sort of the king of the sea if you will of like the sea beasts so um yeah so that it, it, what it exactly is i don't know and i don't know that they know it either how did christianity start jesus very good yes no i followers of jesus that's that's really what it is after jesus started christianity started the catholic church he founded it on peter and the 12 apostles 11 after judas falls you know um but then they spread the gospel uh, in the acts of the apostles you read about how the church started that they went and they, they preached and they did miracles and many people believed other people didn't they martyred the apostles but they kept on going <laughs> and others came after them and they multiplied so that's the history of the church in a nutshell it's always been persecuted but persecution makes it grow it's kind of like the egyptians they persecuted the israelites but they grew even more so the church does best actually in times of persecution typically so good question other questions? Any others?
Maybe a question for you. Uh, anybody not have a Bible yet? Okay, don't have a Bible yet. Okay, do you need one in English or in Espanol? Spanish. English or in Espanol? English for you. Okay, all right. We'll make sure that Lupe, we get you guys. And you guys need one too? English or Spanish? English, right? Yeah, okay. We'll make sure that Lupe, we get... Talk to Lupe so we can make sure we get you three Bibles. Yes, you also? Okay, all right, good. Yeah, we have we have extra Bibles, so just talk to Lupe and we'll get you them, okay? Very good. This, and you know who Lupe is? Wave your hand. Yes, that's Lupe. Talk to her. She will get you a Bible, okay? Important. Good. Yes. Good. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Next weekend is Thanksgiving. Next weekend is Thanksgiving, so we won't have class next week but we will have time for you to catch up. For those of you who don't have Bibles, it's important you get caught up. Okay, it doesn't mean break, nothing. It's important you pray every day. That is the homework, okay? So if you're not praying every day, you need to start praying every day because prayer is the whole point of this class, that you love the Word of God and that you pray, okay? Good. Any other questions? Good. I, I think we're getting close to the adults coming back in. So uh, we'll go ahead and we'll transition to that. Yeah, folks are coming back on in. Francis got a question back there. Can you help me, Gabe, with this? Move over there. Gabe, can you help me move? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Listen. We got our mobile people going back there with microphone to the back for Francisco. Got that. Okay. We've got a couple questions in the back, so we'll go ahead and make sure we got our microphone runners going to the back there. Great. Why did God still use Moses as his representative even though he broke the commandment of not killing? Ah, great question, because God's merciful, right? He, he repented, um, and he had to do penance for it. I, so we see that he spends 40 years changing his character, you know, to not become the murderer anymore. So but it's a good question. It's saying, why does God use imperfect people to accomplish his plan? Because that's all he's got. That's all he's got. <laughs> Haven't found a perfect person yet other than the Blessed Mother. And Jesus, who is the Word of God, made flesh. So... Um, everybody else has got their own degrees of flaws, but I think it's really important. We realize St. Paul, he also recognized this. He says, look, I persecuted the church, and yet God used me now to, to show his mercy as a first example, right? So very clearly in Moses, we see the greatest prophet, but of course he was a murderer, and he doubted God to the point where he refused to accept the mission until God, like, gave him a helper, you know, like, come on, man, you know, it's just, and then we're going to see later on, even after all the miracles, even after seeing God face to face, he still chokes and isn't able to get into the promised land. And you're like, how is that possible after everything? But that's human nature. We always are free to choose, right? And that's really remarkable when you think about it. Even after seeing God face to face, you can still make choices that are bad, right? Other questions? Had a few from the jar, so if we don't have immediate ones, I can uh, give a couple from, from here that were, that were good. Um, so Leviathan, we answered that. Was that your question, Leviathan? A real, okay, somebody asked, was Leviathan a real creature? Yes, uh, Leviathan, we don't know exactly what it was, but it was probably a, just a really scary sea monster um, because they really didn't categorize the creatures there, but just they went on ships and they found terrible things in the ocean, and there you go, so who knows. It was, it was a symbol for everything that was evil in the ocean, okay? Right. Do we know the place it, where the place is where God appeared to Moses in the burning bush? Uh, more or less, we know where Mount Horeb is, right? So we, we kind of know where Mount Sinai is, and uh, but uh, there isn't a place like here's the burning bush. We don't we don't have that. So yeah, general idea, but not exactly. Okay. If the world began with Adam and Eve, how did we get different nationalities of people who look so different from each other? I don't know. Ask a geneticist. Okay. I don't know. I, it, it's saying you know we we. 
the, genetically we're no farther apart than like 56 cousin or something like that. So I mean, it's, it's saying how did how did all the, the the different things go about? I am not a biologist, so I don't want to step out of my depth. I don't know. However, uh, it is an, it is a thing. There you go. Maybe you should do a homework project on that. Just saying. Okay. What became of the idols Rachel stole and hid from Laban and then equated to those made when Israelites fled into the desert? Uh, okay, right. So, so we didn't really cover that, uh, but it was in the reading uh, that uh, Rachel, when she left her, uh, her father Laban's house, she stole his household gods, uh, so she would have the inheritance kind of thing. Um, but then after a period of time... Um, or uh, Jake, Jacob made everybody destroy the idols that they had brought with them out of Laban's house. So eventually they were destroyed. So that's what happened to them. Um, and then equated with those Israelites when they were in the desert, they were making Egyptian gods, whereas this is not Egyptian gods, but just more kind of pagan Canaanite gods. So there, there are lots of different gods that they worshipped in those lands, so I'm not sure exactly which gods Laban worshipped. He kind of was like playing the whole field, right? He worshipped... They all the one God, but he also worshiped other stuff. So who knows? Yeah, it's kind of complicated. All right. Good. If somebody wants a Bible in Spanish, um, we have some Bibles for purchase in Spanish, I think. Yes, Lupe? Do we have Bibles in Spanish? No. We're waiting on them. Oh, we don't. Okay. All right. Um, I think it's the Biblia Latinoamericano. That's the one that uh, is used in the lectionary. Um, so talk to Lupe if you need a Spanish Bible, and we'll try and get them... We'll figure something out. Okay, very good. Other questions? Anything at all? Yes, got one up here in front. Da, 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 da. And if there aren't more, I have a question. So, up here, Joe. Are there descriptions of these sea monsters? Are there what? Descriptions. Descriptions in the Bible? Yes. Um, not, uh, kind of. I think there was a description of Leviathan in one of the prophets, but I, I, I'd have to look it up. I, I don't remember. Caught me. Look it up. Yeah. There probably is. Yeah. Good. I had a question. How many came to the healing night last Thursday? How many of you were received something really beautiful? What was neat? Yeah? What, what was it like for you? Yeah, there's the procession with Jesus. That was really lovely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How many, how many of you received something really beautiful when the procession was going around? Yeah. It's really neat. I, I, think, I think God was doing something very profound um, I've just been thinking and reflecting about that a lot of just that what the healing nights, the whole purpose of them is to bring us into contact with Jesus in the Eucharist. And I think that's something special that God's doing here at St. Alice, um, that the, the way that we're doing the healing nights within the context of the Blessed Sacrament, I think the Lord really wants us to lean into that uh, moving forward. So I think he's going to do a lot more in the time to come. So that'll be really beautiful. Great. Question in the back. Yes. Anybody else? Questions you raise. So if you have questions, please raise your hand. If you're in Spanish, we can answer them. Yes, please. So for three weeks, I was um, getting dizzy, and that brought a lot of panic and anxiety. The dizziness was scary. I ended up going to the emergency room and then followed up with two doctors. And... I had um, Carmelo and another lady pray for me, and then later on, Carmelo came to pray again, and then you happened to be available, and every you didn't know anything of my troubles and everything you were saying. Basically, I went home after so much, three weeks of a lot of mental things going on and not being able to walk from my car to my job through the parking lot, because... I felt like I was going to fall to the ground because I was so dizzy. Um, and then I went in for a CAT scan. Well, and I couldn't eat because everything I was eating, I was choking on it. And mm. so for like four days, I couldn't eat because of the anxiety of swallowing. Wow. So I was desperate. And normally I stay here and I just pray in the back and let everybody else go get prayed for. And I went to the front. That was a big thing for me. And then I got up to have somebody pray for me. 
and by the time I made it home, I was able to eat a meal with Ronaldo, and um, I've been good since then. Wow. And it, like I said, it was three weeks of pure, very, very bad things, and I've been good for the whole week. Praise so, the Lord. Praise Thank Lord. you, Jesus. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that's so good. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for sharing that. God is so good. He's so good. Did anybody else have a healing testimony they want to share? Anybody receive something that they wanted to share? You all saw, of course, on Sunday, uh, our Artemio, yeah? Or at the Spanish Mass they did, he was, he was walking around. Uh, so he's been walking around. It's great. You need to take, take off the bracing and strengthen that leg a little bit. But, like, he's healed. That's so awesome. He broken, broken knee in three weeks. There's bone, and he's able to stand on it. I'm like, ah! It's awesome. So God's good. He's alive. So, And the thing is, is that, remember this, friends. God doesn't heal each person's physical issue. But he heals enough people to make a point. Remember that. The point of healing miracles is not that God came to heal all of the physical problems that are here because he left a lot of people in Israel with their physical issues. But what he did was he healed enough people to convince people that, hey, I'm serious, and if you give your life to me, it's going to be okay. Right? So we're seeing like, a continuous miracle right here with Don. Are you in pain? No. Okay. So Don has been... See, he's still... In, we, we prayed. We prayed for Don at the healing night, and I was like, Don, stand up, and we're going to pray. And he's like, yeah, it's still, it's still the same. You know, still the same. But what's amazing about this is like, Artemius was like a one-time thing, but this is ongoing right now because he still doesn't have a hip. Still no hip, sitting here in a wheelchair without a hip, and he should be in excruciating pain, and he's not, and he hasn't been since September. Been completely no pain since September. So this is a constant healing miracle that is ongoing since September, every day, every moment. It's like the manna every single day. Isn't that amazing? Like, I mean, come on, people. <laughs> It's not, it's, it's, not, it's, not about, it's not about it's not about our resources. It's about God and his power and his creativity. He heals in a lot of different ways to show us that he has very, very omnipotent power and he can do whatever he wants, right? So whether he, he, he completely heals something and gets new, new bones or whether he you know, heals dizziness or, or reintegrates the nervous system or whether he just simply leaves things the way they are but completely takes away the pain, that's amazing. So let's come before the Lord as we prepare for adoration. It's the same God, it's the same Lord, the same one who fulfills all the scriptures, who is the new Moses, the new Joshua, the new David, the new Adam, the new Abraham. All these things that were Old Testament stories and prefigurements find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. He's right here and he loves you and he's going to come out in front of us. So let's prepare our hearts for that so that we can uh, receive the grace God wants to give us tonight before we go home.
O salutare sostia, qui cevi pandis ostium, bella premunto stilia, taro perfer auxilium, unitrino que domino, sit sempiterna gloria, Qui vitam sine termino, nobis donet in patria. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits, who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Mary, Mother of God, Saint Joseph, Saint Alice, pray for us. Saint Elizabeth of Hungary, pray for us. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May the souls of the faithful departed, the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Next week, we don't have classes. It's Thanksgiving, um, but we, our homework for the next class we have is to finish Exodus and go ahead and um, uh, read uh, the book of Leviticus. Also, you can skim through it. Some of it's boring, but you can just skim through it. Uh, we'll kind of cover it a little bit as well. We have enough time to catch up. Lord Jesus, truly present in the most holy Eucharist, I ask you to pour forth your grace upon each one of us so that this week we would give our lives more fully to you. Blessed Mother, we ask that you would open our hearts to see the gift of your Son and that we would pray every day. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners and at the hour of our death, amen.